Well, gentlemen, I have one o'clock. You want to go ahead and get started? Sounds good to me, Stephen. Let's do it. Okay, great. Well, good afternoon to everyone there on the East Coast, and good morning if you're on the West Coast. Uh, thanks for joining us for today's webinar, Ask Without Fear, Powerful Secrets to Help Fundraisers Handle Objections. My name is Stephen Shattuck, and I'm the VP of Marketing here at Bloomerang, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. And I'm joined today by two leaders in the nonprofit sector. The first is fellow Boston Bruins fan, Mark Pittman. Good afternoon, Mark. <laughs> Good afternoon. <laughs> Well, Mark, otherwise known as the fundraising coach, he's an international nonprofit uh, organizational development consultant and a fundraising trainer. And he's here today to help uh, all of you uh, nonprofit professionals out there get excited about asking for money. So, Mark, thanks for joining us. It's my pleasure. And also joining Mark is my colleague Jay Love. He's the founder and CEO over here at Boomerang. Hey there, Jay. Hey. Hi there, Stephen. Some of you may recognize Jay as the original co-founder of eTapestry. He's currently a senior vice president at Avectra, in addition to his duties here at Boomerang. So thanks for joining us, Jay. So Glad what we're going to do, here. yeah, what we're going to do today is, is Mark is going to get us started here. He's got a, a great presentation. Uh, he's going to share some tips on effective fundraising. And after his short presentation, he's going to hand it over to Jay who's going to talk about how to keep all those donors donating to your organization after you've gotten them to donate, which is what Mark's going to talk about. And as always, what we do on all of our Bloomerang webinars is we'll leave some time at the end uh, for a quick Q&A session. So if you hear something during either Mark or Jay's presentation, something maybe you'd want elaborated or explained further, uh, please feel free to send those questions over via the chat functionality. Um, I will see them. Uh, Mark and Jay will also see them. Try to answer as many questions as possible uh, up until the 2 o'clock hour. So Mark, without any further ado, uh, why don't you take it away for us? All right. I'd be glad to. So what I'm going to try to do in just about 20 minutes is blast through the, the format of asking for money that I, talk, I call Ask Without Fear. Uh, what I'm going to also try to do is highlight through throughout the time how to overcome objections in every step of the asking process because I think that uh, when we have a structure around our asking, we can do a much better job at effectively asking, a answering objections the three times that they can happen that we can do something about them. Before they come up, we can answer objections. While they're coming up, after they're coming up, we can, handle the, we can answer some of them. Um, so it's best to front load <laughs> the answering as we're doing our ask and uh, talking to the donor. Um, but the structure all, all helps with that. Before I get into the structure though, I just want to say I think fundraising is the best privilege in the world. I think it's we get to do uh, the highest calling that could be out there. We get to talk to people about their values. We get to talk to people about their legacy and what they want to make different and change in the world and how do they want to make the world a better place. We get paid to do this. We, or we're volunteers, but we get to do this, have the, participate in this with people. And for me, it's like this, uh, this power cord here. Our nonprofits are a wall of outlets. And um, some of them are three prongs, some of them are two prong. Here in the United States, we used to have uh, two pr just two prongs, and then uh, we got two prongs with one side being a fatter side. And if you've ever tried to stick a, a plug with two prongs, one side fatter, into an outlet that doesn't have the fatter one side, it's really frustrating. But we do that with our donors. We often will try to, our donor is the electrical cord, and we'll often try to shove them into something that, a, a a part of our organization that doesn't fit. Uh, well, when we do walk up and down the wall of our, our nonprofit with the donor, get to know them a bit, let them get to know our organization, and then get to plug them into the outlet that fits them best, it's electric. Their eyes light up, and usually if I, if I could see all of you here, um, oh, type in the chat bar. If you, anybody that's on this webinar right now that has had that moment when they've asked the donor for money and the donor's eyes lit up with joy that they could give. Just say yes in the, right into the chat box there. 
lots of people. Yeah, that's where it becomes addicting. You guys get it. Because when you start having those yeses where the donor's eyes light up, you realize it doesn't matter if I have to go through five no's to get to that yes. This might be that next yes. And that's why I think that fundraising is an extreme sport because I think it just has all the, all the adrenaline rush that I'd imagine you'd get from bungee jumping. But you don't have to risk your life to do it. All you have to do is risk a little rejection. So hey, let's get into, I'm glad there's still lots of yeses coming on. This is awesome. Um, the, the structure that I do as a Gen Xer, I heard Get Real growing up a lot. Um, so I decided to use Get Real as a fundraising structure in part because often when we get into fundraising, we think we have to contort ourselves into something that we're not. We think we're not a sales, oh, I'm not naturally a salesman. Right now, all my coaching clients are introverted task people, and they think they all have to become extroverted people people uh, to, to be effective fundraisers, and they don't. So part of what I, the, the reason I use Get Real is just it, you get to be yourself. But the other part is Real stands to be, is an acronym also. So the R is for research, the E is engage, the A is for ask, and the L... It's for love, really, but you know some people you can't really you don't really love them, but you 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 kind of like them. Uh, other or some people you have to love because you're committed to, but you choose to like. And then there are other people that you just have to live with their response. So I, I parsed out the the love a little bit. Uh, in the next 15 minutes, we're going to go through each stage of that and show how that we can answer objections in each of those. So the when it, we get to search, when we t when I ask nonprofits, what is it that you're you want to raise, they don't know. If I were to ask you right now, how much money are you trying to raise this year? Statistically, a vast, a lot of you on this call would say, well, more, more is better. We don't have a defined goal. And it's like that, that old uh, book that's perfect for high school graduates and for uh, lots of other people. The title is, if you don't know where you're going, you'll probably end up somewhere else. It's the same thing here. So you need to research your goal. Before you get into researching donors, you need to figure out what is it you want to do. So some people put together a whole case statement. In fact, I just got off a call where we were working with um, a person that was putting together a case statement for her cause. And the, uh, the kind of back of the envelope way I describe a case statement is if you were to have to stand in front of a court of law and argue for the veracity of your cause, what would you say? You'd have to put in all the statistics about why your cause is the right one to give to, why the need is real, why your organization is trustworthy. You'd also want to put in all the heart stories, all the, the real life examples of the world being made a better place, whether it's land being conserved or children's lives being changed or elderly people getting food, whatever it is that you do, pets being rescued, um, you'd put in the heart and the, and the head. Then, as you're writing out your case statement, you can start um, listing out the dollar amounts and put it through something like a gift range calculator. I have one at giftrangecalculator.com. There are other ones on the web that um, have different, basically the same statistics that we, we've been studying with Giving USA uh, for over 50 years now. I tend to be more conservative, and here's why. Usually, people tell you that the top goal the top gift of your whatever you're trying to raise should be 10 to 25 percent of your goal. So I know it's just as hard to ask for 25 percent as it is to ask for 10 percent. So that's why I put 25 percent as the top goal. Uh, this is uh, and the slide in front of you shows $100,000 to raise that. You need your first gift to be $25,000, and you need five prospects. Statistically, we find you need three to five prospects. Again, I'm just trying to be conservative in um, helping you map out your goal. This is a perfect tool for not only planning your, your cause, planning your whatever your fundraising goal is, it's also perfect for using with donors to help overcome objections because one of the biggest objections donors have is I don't want to be on the hook for the whole cause. I don't want to have to do it. I don't have to pay for it all. So when you map it out this way, you, they can see that you have a plan and you're asking them to be part of that plan. Some of you are more statistically uh, accurate than I am. You'll notice at the far right that you raise 128% if you were to follow this mathematically exactly. There's three reasons for that. First of all, I find that most projects tend to go up in cost. They don't tend to go down. Whether it's healthcare or construction or staffing, things costs tend to increase. The second one is we tend to not factor in donor appreciation into our fundraising. We tend to pull together the case statement Write it, list out all the costs it's going to take to do what we want to do. And we forget that we need to thank the people that brought us there. So raising more money helps. And the third thing is people love to 
people love backing a winning horse. One of the, there are economists out there that are doing some really cool testing of, of uh, fundraising appeals. One of them that was done both in Florida and, and in Chicago sent out two direct mail letters for the same computer cause and uh, a computer lab that they were trying to raise money for. The only difference in the in this, the letters was one of them said we're just getting started, and the other one said we're over 50% of the way there. The over 50% of the way there pulled in three times as much money as they were just getting started. People like to back a winning horse. So while there are some people that like to invest in seed money, there are more people that like to back a winning horse. So once you start coming near, near the, your goal, it's great to be able to go blow past it. So gift range calculator is a good way to help overcome objections. And then you can also just do other research. Um, with your, now that you've got your case statement and you've started to think about your dollar amounts, you can go, uh, well, in fact, we'll go back to look at the dots. What you can also do, if your board members say we need to raise $100,000, you could go to giftrangecalculator.com, put $100,000 in, and say, awesome. We need five people that we think could give $25,000. Who would we go to? Who do you think? And, then, and don't say it with a chip on your shoulder like, so, who is it, huh? But <laughs> be nice. Be, be, appreciate their enthusiasm for how much they want to raise. Uh, and as you start building that names list, then you can go through the research in your prospect. Look at the Google their name, figuring out what they give to. Um, you can just put a spreadsheet with um, asking people what their capacity is on a scale of one to five, what their philanthropic intent is on a scale of one to five, and what are their interest in your cause is on a scale of one to five. There are different ways you can do uh, the research, both from your desk and talking to board members and other donors, going over lists of names, asking them what they know. You can also go hire groups uh, like Blackboard Analytics or WealthPoint, uh, hire services that can do research. But the real, the real thing here to do, remember is to be realistic about it. Uh, it's, you can feel like you're moving your ball, ball forward on the field when you're doing your research because you're, you're visioning, you're planning, you're creating this mathematical formula for how you're going to reach your goal. Everything feels wonderful, but you haven't asked anybody for money yet. So just be realistic about it and, and avoid what Zig Ziglar calls paralysis by analysis. We're going to blow through the engage step into the ask step, but I want to just, that's not because the engage step isn't important. What, what engagement does in helping overcome objections is uh, you get to know the donor. It's like dating. What I, what I, I think the 2008 housing market bust was one of the best things that happened for North American nonprofits because up until that point, we thought we were doing a good job developing relationships with donors, but what we were really doing was invoicing them. We sent out a mailing and every year they'd send us a check. When push came to shove and they had to, they had to focus on who really, they really wanted to give to, we were shocked that we were left out in the cold. We weren't in their inner circle. It forces us to get back to the dating step and building the relationship. We've learned about them on paper. Now we get to learn about them. And, and the, as I was just talking to the, uh, the person on my coaching call, I said, we, it's very good to study donors in their natural habitat. Go to their office, go to their home, go to the clubs that they're at, see how they interact. How do they like to be thanked? Do they have a lot of pictures up that, uh, of people that they can't possibly know well, but they're famous celebrities? Or do they have a lot of little plaques from community organizations? You can learn all sorts of things about how you're going to thank your donors and the things that matter to them. You can use the telephone. I think the telephone is having a resurgence in our, in our highly technological age where you can still get the tone of your voice, the enthusiasm in your voice, and the cadence of your voice, and, and you don't have to be there at the same time as them because you're generally going to get voicemail. Uh, you can send letters. Again, handwritten letters. I like blue ink. That tends to be just remarkable. People get a real note from you. Print the name off. Uh, you could use Google Alerts to do the engagement step. You could put your donor's name in a Google Alert. Go to google.com slash alerts. And then anytime their name comes up in the news, you could get emailed something say, from them. And you could either print it out or you could say, I just found this in the paper or congratulations on your honor. The big thing is you don't want to be creepy. You don't want to say, hey, I set up a Google alert on you and so I'm spying on you. And you know the NSA re reports when they were snooping in on your cell phone call said that this was happening. You don't want to do that. But you do want to acknowledge people. Um, Quickly, one, one way Google Alerts helped me with a, a board member, my board chair for two or three years, I didn't realize he was the head of a national industry organization. 
put his name in the Google Alerts, and all of a sudden I started seeing him popping up in national media, his name. Not quite mainstream, but national in his field. And so I was able to say, hey, I was reading this article the other day about the, your field, and I saw that your name came up. Thank you. It's really neat to know somebody from our hometown has leadership and has, that we know as a leader is also received as a leader nationally. So those are all engagement tools. Part of the big deal with engagement is that you're looking to find out what will motivate the donor to give, and you're looking to prove to the donor that you're not treating them like an ATM, that you see them as a person, not just an ATM. Uh, I have the can of spam there because email, we tend to get a little bit too flip and in, uh, in nonprofit use of email. We think it's free and it's not really. Not only does it take staff time to do an email correctly, but it also, uh, if the minute we start abusing the, the privilege, people can spam us, they can uh, remove us, they can automatically have our messages deleted or they can leave our mailing list. And so we lose all the, all the fact, all the benefit of having a good email system. Uh, and then social media is amazing. There's so much on social media that we can do to keep up that engagement right from our desk. See something pop up on Facebook. Great, we can acknowledge that. We can follow people on Twitter without their permission and start just interacting with them that way on Google Plus also. So there's all sorts of ways you can start the engagement. But this all leads up to the ask. There are some steps with the ask that make it important. This is where the, the plug gets, boom, put into the outlet, and this is where the, the electricity happens. So here's, here's um, well, first of all, when you're setting up your ask, this is a freebie, I didn't put this in the slides, but when you're setting up your ask, make sure that you make it clear that you're gonna, this is different than an engagement step. You're setting up, you're making your call for a major gift to make, a solicitation. Now, I wouldn't say necessarily I want to talk to you about the money that you're going to give to our cause, but I would say something like, hi, Joe, this is Mark. I'd really love to get together with you for lunch or over coffee um, to talk about our project, or maybe you could say the annual fund, just enough so that they know that you have a purpose for being there. The first few solicitations I was a part of my, that I personally did I, 20 years ago, I didn't let them know that. And so I spent the whole time not listening to them at all, but trying to manipulate the conversation to be something that would be whatever I thought my spiel was. I thought I had to have a spiel that was rehearsed. Uh, I didn't realize I was looking at donors and trying to figure out what is the donor's ability and our need meet. So make the, when you make the ask, it makes it, when you make the setup, the, the solicitation setup with, I'd like to talk to you about our project, it makes it a lot easier because you can chit chat with a donor. And then if you forget or you get scared, the donor will say, well, didn't you come here to talk about what you're doing with your nonprofit? And, and then you can, you're off to the races again. If you, if you, even if you get cold feet, they'll help you. Some ways to make your ask easy as always make your own gift first. And I love doing this with boards because I, I really hammer this one home. You gotta make your own gift first. People have internal bs ometers. They know when you don't have any skin in the game, when you haven't, done, uh, you haven't made your gift. So you have to make your gift first. Does that mean you, you're giving at the level you want them to give at? Of course not. But uh, you need to stretch. If you're asking people to consider giving 10 times their normal gift because you're in a campaign, you need to ask yourself to stretch 10 times also. Uh, when you make it itself, shut up. <laughs> I, usually when I'm doing the expanded presentation of this, I have a picture of Mr. T. Shut up, fool. Uh, the reason you're, you want to, what you do is you, I would recommend your phrasing be, I'd like to ask you to consider a gift of and tell them the specific gift. I like asking for the big amount. I want them to know that I'm asking them to prioritize their giving. This clears up a lot of objections because they know exactly what you're asking them to do. Asking them, will you just support our cause is a cop-out. It's not really asking. It, it, they don't know what it is. They may think $250 is supporting the cause when you really wanted $250,000. But the minute you get that dollar amount out, shut up. Most sales training will say, oh, that's it's, he who speaks first loses. It's all about win-lose. And that's not it with us in nonprofits. It's not win-lose. What you're doing is you're giving that you're asking that person to do something they've never done before or they haven't done at that level yet. They just need them to process. So by your being quiet, you're allowing them time to process. Then they'll tell you when they're done processing by being the first to speak. This is the part where you're totally out of control and it, it, it freaks you out. 
usually what they what you can use in and to help you with that ask if you can't get that dollar amount ask you could print out the gift range chart and say will you give in this area and wave your pen over an area uh, you could have renderings you could have pictures sometimes it helps to focus your eyes and their eyes on a piece of paper or on a, a video as opposed to focusing it on each other it doesn't seem as confrontational that way after you've made the total dollar ask, then you can say, well, you know, $1,000 a year is really only about $84 a month. It's like a cable bill. Oh, that's when you can start. Everything you do after the ask is try to get back on the same side of the table as them. You've, set at odds, you've put yourself at odds with them by asking them to take action. Then everything you do is, is help them come across, come on the same side of the table. Part of the way to do that is you can uh, I call it tangibilitize your ask only because I wanted to irritate my high school English teacher. I thought that would do it. But you, Heifer, I'll just leave this slide here. You'll get the recording. Heifer does it a really creative way, and a lot of other places have done this now, of trying to get you, people to think tangibly about this gift that they're giving to the overall cause, to unrestricted giving. And I love that it doesn't feel bait and switch. Right in there, there's this paragraph that says, hey, look, you're giving to our cause. You, we understand you're giving to our cause. But so, so if you give a gift to the cow, we're, we fill all the cows in New Guinea, we're going to buy chickens and turkey. That's just what we're going to do because we, we know you trust you. So, and we can answer questions about that later. I want to really show you a quick exercise you can do with your board or your team to really hit home some of the objections. Because Normally, if a donor says yes, you're off to the races, pull out the pledge form. If they say yes too quickly, you can say as calmly and as smoothly as possible, a year for the next three years. <laughs> and I've actually had that happen. I've had a donor say yes and uh, too quickly for me. I knew I left money on the table. And I asked her to write a gift again, the same check next year, without knowing what the check was. She said, sure, I'll do that. And it turns out she became one of the top donors for a particular project we were in because her gift was higher than I expected. So usually they're going to say yes or no. I'm not a yes. They may say no, which is atypical, because after you've researched them, researched the cause, and uh, engaged them some, you've sifted through a lot of people that won't be a good fit for your nonprofit. But often they'll have an objection. And one of the best ways to figure this out is to get your your board together, your team together, your staff together. I've done this with groups of specific to teams or groups that are just at a conference. And have everybody think about right, asking their friends for whatever they think is a lot of money. And then one post-it note per excuse for why they couldn't give. Oh, my kids are in college. Uh, we'll talk to this. Yeah, don't have the money. It, my kids are in college. Then you put them all on a wall, group them together into common themes. And as a team, you work together to answer those objections. Because invariably, people say they don't have money. Well, somebody else will say, yeah, you know, I didn't have money either, but these people have less than I had, so I needed to give. So you can start coming up with stories w as your team. We could write these all out. Typically, there are only five to seven excuses or objections. Maybe I've had teams come up to 11. But if you have your teamwork on it together, it becomes not just this generic somebody from somebody at place else said, their people are giving to us, but Joe, who I sit with every month at the board, or Harry, who I see gives to this cause, he was telling me the other day that this couple was giving because they felt it was so important. Totally blowing through this because I want Jay's got great information, and I want you to be able to to get that too, and then we'll have question and answers. Um, so, but I want to go through just so I'm going to just go through the the objections part here with. Some of the, the most common ones are, this isn't a good time. We don't have the money right now. And you could just easily respond to them. Well, when can we come back to you? If that, you're getting that a lot, you could start putting in do stories in your engagement of people that don't have money but are still giving. You could start highlighting them in your cultivation material. Um, giving elsewhere is the best objection in my book because at least they're philanthropic. And I, I had a boss that once looked at a donor square in the face and said, awesome. I'm glad you're giving us elsewhere. How do we get on your top 10? And they said, what? So how do we get a seat at the table? We are so good at what we do. I know we'll quickly rise to the top three of your giving priorities, but how do we just get a foot in the door? And the donor told them. It was really, it was, and it, when you say we are so good at what we do, it totally recommits you to your cause too. It's, it's pretty empowering.
The last one that I joke about is if they're not interested, what, are they comatose? You've already researched your cause, researched them, engaged them. You didn't just ask them willy-nilly. You had a plan in doing that, so they're not going to be they're not going to be not interested, most likely. If they are, then you can always ask every, end every solicitation with, who else should we be talking to about this? Who, who do you know on your bowling team? Who do you know in your Rotary Club that might be interested in giving? And then the last step of research, the so research, engage, ask, and then it's live, like, and love. If they say yes, great. Get the receipts out. Take, you know, do the, whatever your processes are for who gets personal calls, who gets personal thank you calls, notes, handwritten notes, all the other stuff that you do. But if they say no and you can handle that well, you'll set yourself apart because in most people that are in business have the sales training of it's all a numbers game. You got to get more asks out there because more numbers in the hopper. And if they say no, flush them and move on. With nonprofits, we don't have the privilege or the, the numbers to be able to just flush them and move on, but their no could be legitimate. It may not be a good time. But in my almost 20 years in the business of raising millions and millions and millions of dollars for nonprofits around the world, I rarely come across a hard and fast no. Most no's are just no for now. It just isn't, a, they're, they, they're saying no now, but if you go back to them in a year, they may be open to that. And so you keep that relationship. And, and um, one of the best stories I have of that is a donor who pulled a $40,000 gift from us, from an organization I was working on with, for about 10% of our annual fund. He, we cut the check, sent it back, but we kept it in strategy for relationship buildings. And 18 months later, he was giving half a million to us. So, and I could talk about that, the details of that story if you want later. Um, so the business is much more than just the, the, everybody has an eight worth. And so part of the love step is, is recognizing the fact that even if they don't give you money, they're still worthwhile as individuals, even if your organization doesn't have time to invest in heavy relationship building, they're not, you, you need to live with their response. Boom. So to sum up my whole 20 minutes, 26 minutes, sorry, <laughs> you can nope, do it. All, yeah. Okay, great. Fundraising is a tremendous opportunity and part of the overcoming the objections is having the enthusiasm of knowing that you're, you're offering people something, remembering all the yeses that you've gotten in the past and knowing that this could be the right time. Whether you're asking on a letter or phone call or face-to-face -face ask, you're, rather than telling yourself I'm probably bothering people, telling yourself, I'm probably, this could be the, the thing that they've been talking about. This could be the cause that they've been looking for that will add meaning to the stuff that they do 40, 60, 80 hours a week. Um, and, and also, the, the whole idea of ask without fear, part of it is courage is not the absence of fear, it's pushing through fear. If there were no fear, you wouldn't need courage, but you're, you can have courage as you're asking because this, you're making the world a better place. Jay? I'm going to turn it over to you because I could do this for hours. <laughs> hey, thank you, Mark. And I'm sure there's going to be plenty of questions that will keep us fueled as we, as we go into the Q&A period. Thank you so much. Well, I'm going to come in and talk about some of the technolo technology assets that will help you with this asking process. And the final piece of the puzzle there is the effective use of a donor database to make the ask a natural progression of a relationship. And I'm basing this off of my involvement over the years. I, for, many, for 30 years now, I've been a technology vendor. But for the last 20 years, I've been also a donor to many organizations. And for the last 10 years, I what would be considered probably a major donor and actually have run a couple campaigns as a campaign chair for that. And really figuring out this natural progression of the relationship is so important. And it really, to make that come to life with your database is not that difficult. There's really uh, one panel piece of that to make it come to life. The effective use of the donor database and is one simple aspect here, and this is going to fool a lot of you there. The, it doesn't require a lot of fancy features or a lot of capabilities. I feel like the, the key part of making it uh, a tool that you can help everybody with is having it be the type of tool that everybody on your team is knowing how to use it and uses it on a daily basis. And if you can make that come to life, that really changes everything. We're going to allude to that being a revolution here in a second. But if everybody can do that, then that will come to life. And I, I, in my situation of helping with some capital campaigns, in one situation we had a database 
that had a wealth of information and another one we had no database at all to speak of and there were very few notes and the details of even how the organization built their original building no one had kept that information there we didn't even have the names let alone the uh, dollar amounts and what led to those gifts being the founding of the organization in the early years so let's talk a little bit further about this if you can assist when you talk about this final piece of the puzzle and how do you assist in making total usage happen well that boils down to the nature of the product that's the biggest and not if not the the huge factor that comes into play there and we have found this out over the years I, I've gone back to so many of my customers and these are the same customers that took me through the ring quite a bit as they were deciding which system to use and I you always find quite a bit of difference if you go back a year or two or three later and every time I went back to the organizations I was always amazed at how little of the application they were actually using in fact the majority of nonprofits use less than 20 percent of their databases functionality so a large amount of features equals this complexity and one of the things I always talk about is that database complexity keeps fundraisers out of it and I often tell the story of my alma mater which is one of the universities here in the Midwest and when they approached me the first time for making a major gift we sit down my wife and I with this organization and the major gift officer and had a two-hour lunch and really shared all of our hopes and dreams and passions and sort of opened up our soul to this entire uh, spectrum of what they were wanting to know and we thought that that was well covered with them nine months later that person was no longer employed and a new individual a new major gift officer contacted me and asked me to lunch and in the first 15 minutes we were going through the same exact questions and Mark I don't know if you've ever heard of this happening for organizations but to me it was really sort of embarrassing uh, to know that they really did not keep any of that information and after a while it became quite frustrating for me and I, I mentioned that <laughs> Jay I had an 80 year old owner I had an 80 year old donor blow up at me after I asked him how did you come to our school um, he threw some expletives in my face before we had even gotten uh, ordered our dinner and said don't you guys keep any records yeah why, why are you not talking to each other I've shared this story five times over the last 80 years what are you talking about what what kind of hat you know it, it was not pleasant <laughs> so this whole concept of keeping it simple enough for people to use I'm really going to review that as a revolution uh, and if we think back to the uh, the French Revolution and what happened there the revolution I'm talking about here is a revolutionary change from this game-changing idea of keeping it simple enough that even the executives and the fundraisers can use the the day and time of a database being used by a single administrative person has really got to end if we're going to let it be a tool that helps in major gift fundraising now certainly it can still continue to be a tool for direct mail and it can still be a tool for other areas but if you really want it to be the right arm that we all need in major gift fundraising to come to life then we have to make sure that we have something that everybody can use and we have this and I when we talk about revolutionary change I also think it is where an idea whose time has come and based upon relentless execution so we're going to show you some examples of that execution how we make that come to life for you so the game-changing ideas that we're talking about here uh, a database or a CRM so intuitive that no training is needed and I know that's hard for some people to believe but that's what we want to be uh, re alluding to here is something that anybody can just sit down and start using it and in this day and age of smartphones that carry more functionality than earlier databases ever dreamed of having nobody I know of sat in a class for a full day or a full week in order to use learn how to use their smartphone they just they were intuitive enough that people could sit down and start using it and if you do anyone can and will use it and you can bring the best practices to life and you can focus on the core functions that you would like to see come bring bright light and if all the fundraisers and all the executives of your organization anybody that's involved with talking to prospective donors or existing donors I really feel like that is quite revolutionary and really makes this all come to life in fact it really is the linchpin of engagement uh, and when we talk about that 
making this engagement come into life and being able to track and measure that is what we're uh, alluding to here. Uh, the word linchpin is used to really talk about something that holds all of the elements of a complicated structure together. I cannot think of anything more complicated than building a long-term donor relationship. It requires many pieces coming together and many actions and many details to be tracked there. And the thing that I think really is the glue of this whole area are the engagement levels for that. And engagement tracking, if you know the level and the progression of engagement for any donor or prospect, the relationship is natural progression that we were referring to earlier, that you allow that progression to move to the next step where the ask really comes into play and all the techniques that Mark was alluding to earlier. So how do we, how do we make this engagement tracking come to life? Well, we did this at Boomerang by involving two very, very well-known experts. The first one on the right you can see is Dr. Adrian Sargent, sort of father of engagement and donor loyalty and donor retention in the nonprofit world. And then on the left, Mr. Tom Ahern, our donor communications head coach. And we took all of their factors that they thought were important and built them into the application that we're talking about. And when we do that, we make these particular engagement factors come to life. And think about as you are moving forward with somebody, if you can track this automatically, it makes the positioning of the time to make the ask come about very easily for you. And some of the factors that we're tracking here are the recency and pattern of giving, whether or not they are an outright cash or check giver or whether they're a sustaining donor. What we're referring to there are uh, recurring gift transactions or maybe a multi-year pledge. The number of years of consecutive giving really makes that come to life whether it's an upgrade or downgrade, or maybe they lapse, obviously that moves the level up or down. Then we come into a couple areas that are fairly easy to track if you are uh, tying it in with your website. If people are registering or attending events, you can register them through the website. All event attendance and all volunteer activity are really true signs of engagement for somebody. And then we move into the communication area. If you're sending out emails, if you can easily track whether or not someone opens the email, whether or not they click on something in the email, whether or not they forward it on to other people, they subscribe or unsubscribe from it, those are all factors of moving the engagement needle up or down. If they let you know what their communication preferences are, if you've been smart enough to send out a survey and be able to track whether they would like to get written communications or electronic communications or face-to-face -face or telephone, we do that. And I saw someone uh, mention the face-to-face. -face. And that's what we talk about here with inbound interactions. Anybody that contacts you, we give almost twice the value in the engagement level for that. If someone has picked up the phone and contacted you or emailed you or actually come by your office, that makes such a big difference. And then stewardship, that's another factor here. If they are bringing in matching gifts from their company or from a family foundation, any type of stewardship along with bringing people in as donors and you provide that soft credit for it makes a huge difference. And then in the very near future, we'll be tracking also the social media. So if someone likes you on Facebook or says something about you on Twitter or on LinkedIn, those types of activities all come together to move this engagement level up or down. So let's take a look at a sub couple examples of what we're talking about here. We'll start off here with a foundation. And you'll notice this particular foundation, their engagement level is just at the level of being at cool here. So we move people up or down accordingly to this. This next individual here, James Field, is at a warm level. So we've had several things happen that have moved their engagement level up a little bit. And then when I take a look here at Rob, we can see that he is on fire here. The level of engagement has moved all the way up to the fifth level. So if you can imagine in your day-to-day -day activities, if you could come in on the first day of every week and have a report sitting on your desk and saying, these are all the people that moved up or down one engagement level in my database during the last week, it might be very prudent of you to fill in your gaps of who you're going to call, who you're going to set up appointments with, etc with these, especially if it's a major gift donor from previous years and their engagement level is falling, 
then this makes a big, big difference of being able to track that. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in the Bloomerang software. Any way that you can try to track these engagement levels and see if you are moving people closer to a strong relationship or further away from it, they come into play very, very nicely because uh, we also track this over time. So we can see on this timeline for uh, Melissa here, every touch point that we've had. So you can see we had a letter, we had an email that went out, we wrote a note about our last discussion here, we had a financial transaction to come in. All of those over the lifetime of that donor are being kept in their timeline. And then what you're seeing over here on the right-hand side in this highlight area, these are the areas that are moving the engagement needle the biggest amount for that particular year. Not bad circles, huh, Mark? I so muted myself. Not at all. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got all of those touch points there. But more importantly, being able to create whatever types of reports you want. And this is where I love saying that something is simple and easy enough for the fundraisers and the executives to use themselves. If you can go in and create a report and figure out what headings you want, how you like to arrange them, what you want to subtotal on, what you would like to sort on. In this particular case, we're bringing up the names of people in our database, their current engagement level, the date of the last engagement item with them, the lifetime amount raised, and the largest single transaction. So that translates into a report that looks like this. So you can very easily pull that type of information together and sort of see what are the steps that we're going through and what is the next logical step that can come from that. So those items come together then to all make these engagement levels move from one level to the next, up or down, just during the course of doing our normal day-to-day -day business as we do that. Now, we tie all this together. Stephen had mentioned that we wanted to talk about the retention for that. And I didn't spend too much time on the retention because I wanted to tie into what Mark was talking about with the ask here and, and the fear of asking for it. But one of the things that we do with our dashboard here is be able to show you the current retention level for all of the donors in our database. And this is always showing you exactly 365 days going backwards, and we're seeing how many donors in the last 365 days had donated in the previous 365 days. So you can see what your retention rate is. And this gauge actually changes literally from day to day and from week to week so you can see what's going on and make that happen. And that can be for your entire donor database, or we can set it up so you can take a look at it for various subsets. So that all comes together with creating what we refer to as a next-gen database or CRM system. And two key areas, easy enough for even the CEO to use and enables the fundraising best practices to come to life as part of your day-to-day -day usage. So Mark, believe it or not, we've got about 20 minutes left. And I thought we would open it up there and let people share their questions with Stephen. So if you can bring the... Uh, questions to Stephen. Stephen, as, as those come in from the chat room, if you'd like to point it to either Mark or myself, we'll see if we can try to interactively ask, answer some of the questions that are coming up. Okay, great. Well, we've been doing a little bit. Okay, go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> I was going to jump in. Yeah, I, I know, Mark, that you saw some of those questions coming in through the chat. Um, you know, the one that you responded to from Danielle and Tammy, you know, for those of you who didn't see it in the chat, uh, they were curious. Uh, how how someone would know if a potential donor would be a good fit or how they would know if they're going to plug in to the organization's mission and culture. Mark, what do you think about that? What are good indicators that someone's going to be a good fit other than just the fact that they have the money? Well, I think what, what the one thing that first came to mind when I saw those two questions about what, good, what are good questions for determining donor fit and then how do you determine if a donor is a good fit is you have, to, you have to be clear in your own mind on what your perfect donor is. And I, in the chat I had said, is this for direct mail or is this for face-to-face -face solicitation? Because you can have ideal donors for different, if you really want to get sophisticated, you can have an ideal uh, direct mail donor and I'd recommend putting a picture of her on your, it's usually her, on your monitor. For me, uh, working at a rural hospital in Maine, it was Edith. I knew she was an 80-year-old widow, uh, World War II veteran, 
and I was writing my letters to her. But um, for uh, for face to, for major gift donations, it may be some other ideal type. Um, so being excruciatingly clear on who your ideal is, and how what, how are they married? How many kids do they have? What kind of income? Where do they live? Uh, the reason you want to do that is, as Katya Andreessen says in Robinhood Marketing, is that then you can go and see what are they reading and pull out all the ads out of, those, out of those magazines and stick all the ads up on your wall and say, what are the national marketers telling me about this demographic? What are they trying to appeal to? What are the hot buttons they're trying to appeal to? And then see if your nonprofit fits some of those. That's one way to do it. Another is to be really clear on who you are as a, as a nonprofit, your core stories. So when you're talking to people, you can share some of your stories and, re and chances are good you're not going to get someone who doesn't give a rip about your organization. You might be at, an or at some sort of social service club. That might be it. But you could, um, well, I find, I'm, I'm rambling a bit. I'm sorry about that. So I'll, I'll land the plane this way. I find it always better to be clear on who you are and what you represent and to ask the donor or the prospect about themselves. I love Bob Berg's questions like, so what do you do when you're not in an event like this? Because that way you're not telling the stay-at-home spouse that they're half as worthy because you're not asking them, what do you do for work? Um, well, I'm an at-home dad, I'm an at-home mom is perfectly legitimate and it's not valued in our culture. So just what do you do when you're not standing at a buffet line at the Rotary Club? And people usually chuckle. Um, oh, really? How did you get into that business? Tell me more about that. What got you there? If they're already donated once, you can, if they've already made a gift, you can ask them, what did you like most about what you saw? You know, or what do you like most about what we do? Those are some questions I've found. Jay, do you have some that you like to, to ask that go well in a database? Yeah. Well, I, I think what you're talking about there is uh, if it's appropriate there, what are there other areas of interest and what have they supported mm. in the past? I, I just love to hear about what they, and I don't talk about when I say support, I don't necessarily ask them what they've donated to in the past, but wh where have they volunteered at? People love to talk about any volunteer activities that they've done, and I always ask people, what have you done in the last few years in the way of any sort of volunteer activity? And that really spawns mm. some neat conversations. I like that. So Jay, you know, you, you've been in nonprofit 30 or so years. Is there anything that Mark said that really resonated with you or maybe you, that had been actually used on you and worked? Well, I wish they would have been used on me <laughs> uh, uh, more often than not. Uh, I, I think people do not tend to be themselves sometimes. And, uh, you know, you don't get a chance to really find out, uh, you know, Part of the joy, in my opinion, of making a gift is to really get to know the person who's working with me in that transaction and find out a little bit more about them uh, and and what's driving them and why this mission is important to them. Is it is it just a job or is it something bigger than a job to them? Mm -hmm. Mark, you 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 talked a lot about researching, you know, the, the the donation prospect, and Shane was wondering what are the three key pieces of information that you should collect in that research phase. Three key. What I love to collect when I did a lot of major gift profile things uh, for a client last year for capital campaign. And what I found were the most helpful for us knowing before we even got into the calling them up to set up an appointment because some of these were fairly cold calls. They are people that have been giving nominal gifts maybe, but we were going to ask them to give five and six figure, some seven figure gifts. Um, I liked to see kind of what their work history was, where they, what they, where, they, where they lived and what their work history was. So sort of their life picture sort of, as much as you can. It's not, that can sound really creepy, but I like to see kind of what they do and where they do it. Um, I like to see where they give to, and there's a lot of different, there are a few different areas out there where you can find out where they give to, and if they have a family foundation, you can go to GuideStar and also see what kind of grants their foundation makes. And then I, I happen to like to see what political causes they're attuned to. And it's not because I want to get into politics on the call, but it's in part mostly because I don't want to mess up. 
<laughs> we can most of the organizations I've been part of can have people from all different political persuasions donating to them. Um, the only one that I can think of not having was the political campaign that I ran. Other than that, <laughs> I think that uh, we can have people from all different perspectives. But I want to just choose my language a little bit differently depending on uh, whether I'm talking to people of different politics, political causes. You can see that in their giving. You can also see that um, in their political giving, which you can find online too. Great. What if the person you want to meet with face to face just absolutely refuses to, to maybe get a, a coffee with you or meet face to face? What can you do uh, to sort of get that person maybe on the phone or through email or, or something else other than a face to face meeting? Jay, do you want to handle that or do you want me to? Yeah, I'll be glad. To, in what I have done in the, in the capital campaigns I've been involved with, and sometimes you are dealing with a very, very busy person uh, for that, I've, uh, I've often asked if I could reach out and uh, meet with their spouse if they are extremely busy and see if we can chat a little bit that way, or really just fall back to the telephone and find out when there is a convenient time. And most importantly, I've offered to do that during some part of their drive time if they'd like to talk on a cell phone or after normal business hours or something of that nature, making myself very available uh, to do that. And instead of requesting the coffee time be during the week, is say, you know, is there a possibility I could meet you on a Saturday morning or, you know, late afternoon on a Sunday and chat for a little bit too. And that has worked in some situations for someone that's been extremely busy. Mm -hmm. And what I like to say is um, what I don't like to I don't like to get into th asks on the phone. So often I'll have something that I want to show them, whether it's a gift range cal printout, calculator printout, or it, as simple as that, or as complex as a brochure or video. And um, there are some people that are just legitimately really busy, and so then what you can try to do is find out what they do go to. Uh, with one one client, we ended up doing some high-end donor events, and it wasn't the cause that they were going to go to. They didn't want to get pitched again. They didn't want to get hit up again. Was one of the one of the prospects that said, but they did want to be seen. See, they wanted to be around their peers to be to see and be seen, and so that was something that um, there was a prestigious enough area that they could go to the small and more intimate cocktail party with the right hosts. So you can create a small event to get them. A third way, and probably the best out of the three, is to, to continue trolling your board and your, your, your friendlies, the people that are already giving to you and all. And whenever you're around them saying, hey, you know, we're really trying to, trying to get in front of so-and-so. Is there any way that, you know, do you, do you happen to know her? Do you know how to, where, who might be the right fit to, to open up that door for us? So, yeah, and you really hit the nail on the head there, Mark. Yeah, you really hit the nail on the head is uh, using some other con a mutual contact to, to help make that appointment come to life. And that, that was the, the other key way that we always did that was finding somebody else that we mutually knew and see if there was a, uh, especially if that was a board member, to see if that could help make it come to life. Great. We've got a question from Judy in the chat room. She says that she's new to a small inner city uh, parochial school. It's, it's in a little bit of a low income area. And she really needs to raise money uh, pretty quickly. So she's asking if, if there's a, a way to fast track and ask. And I guess maybe, Mark, you could speak to maybe how long this process should actually mm. take and if there's a way to speed it up uh, when possible. Well, that's an excellent question. One time I was doing a training for, actually, for a consulting group, actually. They had me do an Ask Without Fear training. And the, the, the top guy said, no, Mark. And he, he fortunately scripted the question so that I knew exactly where he wanted me to go. And he was right. He said, that whole engagement step doesn't have to take a lot of time, does it? And, I, and it doesn't. It can be done over a cup of coffee. If it, I think if you have to raise money really quickly, I think the best way to do it is face-to-face. -face. Planning out how, what levels you need. If you're trying to raise $100,000, you need people that will give ten dollars to $25,000. You need some people that will give five dollars to $7,500, that sort of thing. And, and planning that out so that you're using your time most effectively. But then, um, so that's an important part of fast tracking. But the engagement, if you get to it, there's two ways to handle it. One, you can just ask them to talk about the cause. The other one is you could get, ask them to get to know them, to introduce them to the cause. 
But if you find when you're talking to someone about, if you set it up as an engagement and you find that they're really eager to see the neighborhood transformed or to see something that you're impacting happen, you could say, I love a chuckle. A chuckle is very disarming. I, I could say, I would often say something like, well, you know, Frank, I, I didn't come here to ask you for money and I'll pause and then say this time and then pause because that way I'll, it sets up. I am going to ask you for money. That's my job. So <laughs> Frank, you know, I, I didn't come here to ask you for money this time, but we happen to be doing that playground project right here in our community. Would this be a good time to ask you for it or should I give you a call in a couple weeks? In sales, we call that testing the close. Is this a good time? I haven't asked you. I'm just asking if this is a good time to ask you. I'm going to ask you. I'm just asking you when you think I should ask you. Should it be now or should it be in a couple weeks? Uh, they may say never, but generally that doesn't happen. And so it's, it's, they, they could either say, well, yeah, now, or they'll say, yeah, well, <laughs> you don't know what just happened on the stock market or you don't know what happened here or you don't know, you know whatever, or I'm finishing off paying a pledge. You, can, you start getting some of those objections already so that you know when you structure the ask, you can have it. But I don't, I don't think it needs to, some people say it takes 18 months to develop a major gift donor. I don't know who created that. And the cynical part of me thinks it was people that were looking for job security without having results. <laughs> um, if you need to raise money, you need to raise money. And, and I, don't, I would not be, I would err on the side of asking. I've never had anybody offended for ask, that I asked too much. Uh, I have worn co people's coffee on my shirt because they spit it out at me <laughs> and wondered what, what data I was looking at that showed that they had that much money, but, <laughs> but they weren't flattered, not offended. Are you still there, Stephen? Can anybody, can anybody hear me now? Can, in the chat room, can you just say yes if you can hear me? Okay, you guys can hear me. Great. I can't hear anybody else. <laughs> Good. I'm on my own. Okay, I can do that. So any more last questions before we go? to? I've got a special offer for everybody here. Well, Stephen's putting me onto that. So um, if you want a, a, a copy of Ask Without Fear, I think it would work with a DVD too. You can get $5 off by going to my site, fundraisingcoach.com, and, and then when you click on the product, it goes to a shopping cart and you just type Bloomerang in there and you get $5 off. And there's also, so I'll leave that there. You can also go to my site and get a free newsletter. Um, Every other week, I send out my best thoughts on fundraising and asking. And the folks at Bloomerang are going to make sure you get this recording tomorrow. They'll email it to you. Everybody that registered, uh, we had about a third of the people that registered are actually all morning. Oh wow! Some people already have it. Oh wow! Some people already have it. I love that echo. Great. Any anything else that anybody has questions before we go? Otherwise, you can just email me at uh, mark at fundraisingcoach.com. And I would love to thank Jay for the opportunity to be here and for the, his 30 years of database experience has been amazing. He keeps getting better as he creates databases for donors. Uh, and Stephen for moderating this too. Uh, Sister Mary, you get the PowerPoint in your email tomorrow. Stephen, we'll, we'll put it there. Well, thanks everyone for well, thanks coming. Everyone for coming. Uh, please, again, look at me on Twitter, Mark A. Pittman, or you can email Jay uh, for off of the bloomerang.co website, or you can uh, email me with the website, the email on the screen, mark at fundraisingcoach.com. Have fun fundraising. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. You're back. Oh, we're back. Thanks for the wrap up. Yeah, our phone booted us off. So thanks for answering that last question. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> well, yeah, thanks for everyone for joining us today. Um, I will be sending out the, the slides of the presentation, and I'll also be sending out a video recording. So if there's anything that maybe you wanted refreshed or uh, gone over again, you can watch that. Um, so hope everyone enjoyed it, and have a great rest of your day. Thanks again, Mark.